So I just got done recording an hour and a half with David, thinking that I could release it uh, tomorrow on Tuesday. But the conversation went all over the place. There's a lot of editing and uh, shop talk about people and current events that I want to reflect on before it's reviewed and released. Uh, and so I'm doing a rerun. Pork shoulder. Episode 77. This is back when Ryan O'Hearn was on the show. Hope you enjoy. What up, meatheads? It's Travis, American Butcher. And welcome to the Meat Block Podcast. The weekly podcast by butchers for everyone. And this week I'm joined by Ryan and David. And we're going to talk about a specific cut. A specific, specific primal. Not Pacific. It's not the ocean. When I was younger, I used to say specific ocean like it was specifically over there but i have grown out of that anyway today we're going to be talking about pork shoulder so sit back enjoy and trust the information because like sure mix a lot says you could always trust a man who likes big butts they cannot lie and now the meat block good cutting enhances the quality of good meat in his way, the meat cutter is an artist. Poor cutting results in an inferior piece of meat, regardless of quality. This week's episode of the Meat Block Podcast is brought to you by Bunzel Processor Division. Bunzel Processor Division has been in the meat and food processing and packaging industry for over 135 years, offering over 35,000 of high-quality products designed specifically to meet the needs of the meat processing, butchery, food processing, janitorial, and industrial industries. Bunzel Processing Division also specializes in packaging equipment and supplies, offering the Multivac P-Series line of chamber packaging machine, as well as the Clarity trademark line of shrink bags, roll stock film, and vacuum pouches. They have numerous product experts offering outstanding customer service, and they offer free UPS ground shipping on orders $400 or more. Right now, there is a supply chain issue with some companies on vacuum pouches and um, vacuum film for packaging supplies. And if you're in a bind and people are telling you that they're so far out on getting you your materials to package, please check out bunzopd.com, reach out to their sales team, tell them they, they have it ready to go. They have their supply chain on lockdown, ready to help you, the consumer. Please check them out, bunzelpd.com. Once again, that's bunzelpd.com. If you want to support us, the best way to support the show is by supporting them. Thank you. Pork shoulder. So the pork shoulder, like if you were to take a set of hog and you break it up into its three main primals, you got a pork middle, a pork leg, and the pork shoulder. You know, just to prolong this episode from the leg, you could get the hams, you could get the shank, and the you get the hind trotter. From the middle, you could get the belly, the loin, the center cut, and the sirloin, or the rib section. From the shoulder, you could break that up into two pieces, and you got the picnic and the butt portion of the shoulder. And like you may... Of gathered for my intro, we will be using the sexual innuendo to describe the pork shoulder of butt many times. So if that makes you feel uncomfortable, that's good. When most people think of shoulder, they think of the upper part with the copa rib and the collar. And from that, you can get a variety of cuts. But I'm going to talk about the lesser known cut of the picnic, the bastard cousin or stepbrother to the pork shoulder. It's forgotten. It's there. It's part of the subprimal. But people genuinely don't include it in the cat in the conversation when talking about this beautiful, beautiful piece of meat. So look at your picnic. You separated it from your shoulder, and you may have separated your shoulder at your third or your fifth rib, depending on the application you want to do with the copa. And when I mean copa, I mean the copa roll. The thing that you would cure, you know, make your cottage, your charsu, or your capicola out of. And we'll be discussing those further in the episode. Now, the picnic. I've heard it described that the reason it's called the picnic is when you look at the piece, it looks like a picnic basket. For the only way 
for this to make sense to me, you'd have to look at the piece upside down. I'm sure there's a better reason why it's called this. But my segment isn't about semantics or origin. I'm going to talk about the applications for this lesser known, forgotten pork shoulder. So you're looking at it. You have three to five ribs, depending on how you broke it off, the pork middle. If you remove those ribs, I have heard them called Southern Style or Copa ribs. In my opinion, they are the best ribs on the animal. Underneath that, you're going to have a pectoral section or breast section, or for other people or laymans would call it a pork brisket. Seam that off, and then you're left with the cushion halfway wrapped around the foreshank with a little bit of shank meat. Assuming that you smoked your copa ribs, one thing you could do with your pork brisket is season it, truss it, and slow roast it. Just like you would a beef brisket. The longer, the colder, the better. Get the temperature to 190 or 207 and season it to preference. It is a beautiful cut. It looks great in the case when it's tressed, seasoned, and scored. Now, that remainder piece, that bone-in cushion. So you could smoke that, you could brine it, and that could be your picnic ham, which is a great substitute if you're finding that you're selling out of your regular ham. For this, I would inject it to 15% with sodium nitrate at 0.25 for every kg. Rub it in season to flavor. And if you don't have access to a vacuum sealer or a tumbler, rotate it in a tote for seven days. If you have access or access to skin on pigs, this would be preferred. And this makes a great bone in ham or ham substitute picnic ham for about maybe three to four people. You could also remove the cushion. And if you're confused by that terminology, people call it the cross rib or clod if this was a beef cut. Take it off, remove the silver, and you could inject it to the previous mentioned steps at 15% to 0.25% sodium nitrate. Rotate in a lugger for about a week or vacuum seal or tumble. You can net it and hang it and smoke it. And this will serve about two people. It makes a nice little sweetheart ham. If you're a whole carcass institution or running a small shop and you have access to these, no, you're not going to feed a terrible amount of people with it. But what you can do is spark conversation with people saying, what's that? The cushion is also very lean and can be cured and presented as a dry or semi-dried product in a charcuterie case. Just make sure all available water and pH are within the limits of your program. And if you were to bone out your picnic, that little bit of shank meat on it, or trim four, as I like to call it, makes good emulsification, or you could take out the heavy chunks of cartilage and add it to your sausage. The percentage on this trim is about 90-10. This sinewy trim also makes for good hock cheese or good riettes. This next segment is by David. Hey, meatheads. David here. When I began managing the plant that I currently work at, I inherited a few different messes that I had to clear up. One was personal related, which I've talked about before at length. And another was the freezer situation. Now, if anybody out there works in the cut and wrap, you know what a, what a dire and critical situation freezers can be for a small processor. You know, running out of room, old product kind of getting lost in the mix, things stacking up um, that you don't really have any use for, but you keep anyways. You know, it's hard to keep the freezer straight, clean, clear, and organized. And it hadn't been for a long time when I started managing. Um, and so it's been kind of a long job. It's been a long project and we finally just recently got it done. While I was inventorying all of my pork cuts, 
you know, just seeing what we had, what we were going to need for our next round of hogs that we harvested um, for ourselves. And as I was digging through the various freeze trays that were behind other freeze trays, behind other freeze trays, I came upon one tray that had, you know, two to three pound pork shoulder roasts, bone in, packaged, you know, and there's probably, I don't know, 30 of them in there, let's say, about 100 pounds of meat. So I thought, well, I don't need any of those. So I kept looking, sorting product, and I found another tray of pork butts and another tray of pork butt roasts. And then one freeze tray of whole pork butts. And I just wasn't sure why we had so many. So I went out in the front and kind of looked at the retail case, and we were full. The pork butt roasts were all full out there, and I, I was wondering what was up with this. So I went and talked to the owner, and um, we kind of discussed what pork products moved and what didn't. And pork butt roasts, just we can't sell them to save our lives for whatever reason, no matter what the season. Sell a little bit more in winter. Um, because people see those as like a low and slow crock pot sort of thing, but we really can't sell it, which is kind of strange to me because everybody out West is into smoking. You know, everybody's got a smoker or like a, like a sidecar smoker or, uh, a green egg, or they just grill over wood chips. Just everybody is doing low and slow barbecue out West. I felt like, and in Chicago too, everybody's doing low and slow out there. Um, but for whatever reason in our community, people just don't slow cook barbecue everything's quick everything's on a, a super hot grill or it's in a crock pot and you know it's 95 degrees and 90 percent humidity humidity here right now so nobody's cooking in a crock pot and i'm not sure why but barbecue just isn't very popular so that's why we're not selling pork butts i think one of the main reasons is most of the people around here are either farm, farmers uh, construction laborers or contractors just people that generally work super long hours and just don't have time for long and low meals. I mean, when I lived in a different sort of community, when I was living in a city, I was part of a barbecue club and we'd all get together and drink beers and cook meat all day. And it took forever and it was fun, but this, that's just not the sort of thing that happens around here because everybody works, I don't know, 60 to 80 hours in this area. And so I think it's just not really part of the culture. So uh, I've got to figure out how am I going to, how am I going to merchandise these pork butts? Am I going to rework these ones or am I just going to try to sell them and move forward? Um, when you rework a product as per our HACCP plan, uh, the product can only be 20% of the total weight of the new product. So for instance, let's say I've, uh, here's an example. I made hot dogs not that long ago and I forgot to put salt in them. Because our certified organic spice blend doesn't have salt in it. Our, our non-organic does have salt. And it was the first time I had made organic hot dogs. Didn't realize there was no salt in it. Made them. It was 100 pounds. It's a bummer, right? So as for our HACCP plan, <clears throat> not more than 20% of the new hot dogs that I would make with those wrong hot dogs uh, can be the old product. So if I've got a hundred pounds of unsalted hot dogs and want to mix those into a new batch of hot dogs, I've got to make a 500 pound batch. So that's not going to work. You know, I've got probably 300 pounds of pork butt. So that means that if I'm going to bone, if I'm going to thumb, bone those out, maybe once the bones are gone, I've got 200 and I don't know, 270 pounds, 260 pounds of pork butt. Multiply that by five, we're talking over 1,100 pounds of sausage. That's not going to work. So, whether it be fresh pork shoulder I'm going to be working on or whether I'm going to recut these and repack them, I need to think about some things. So, I don't have a retail space the way that a grocery store does. I can't really do a lot of oven ready, fresh displays. So really my challenge is to figure out how to do these things frozen, how to, how to come up with products other than just fresh brats. You know, every, when we harvest 15 or 20 hogs for us, I can't turn every shoulder into brats just because we'll be overloaded. So I need to find some other things, some other, um, freezer, freezer ready or freeze stored 
oven ready foods um, or other ways to cut their shoulders. So here's some things that I'm going to try over the next six months and see what we come up with. Kebabs. Kebabs are something, you know, I've seen uh, at Short Loin, Sean, I've seen him do a lot of oven ready things for their retail space where he works. And I've seen him do some kebabs. So, you know, I think a pre-cut, pre-assembled kebab is a great idea. It's probably not great frozen, but if you have, you know, if you have a fresh case, I do have one refrigerator, uh, a pre-packed kebab that's pre-seasoned, I think would do really well for a lot of people that are into grilling usually. Nothing wrong with a pork kebab, just season it with familiar flavors that people are used to, you know, peppers, onions, teriyaki, sweet and sour, just things that, things that are attractive, um, Maybe some big chunks of pineapple. You know, pineapple and pork go together really, really well. Another one is just the simple blade steak, you know. It's just a just we call them pork steaks, which could mean anything for whatever reason, but uh pork blade steak is a really great cut that are very, very popular in a lot of grocery stores. But for whatever reason at my plant, we cannot sell blade steaks for anything. People just don't eat them. So another one that I tried was uh and we'll be trying more of in the future, are country-style ribs. So when I worked for a major certified organic food retailer, we did country-style ribs as, you know, we'd bone out the pork shoulder and then cut these, these like, three- to four-inch chunks that were an inch and a half across of boneless meat from the shoulder. And they were kind of like big fingers, you know, and we'd put those in the case uh, four across on a tray, and we call those country-style ribs. Now, since I've moved to Michigan, I've seen another way that people do country-style ribs, which is where they'll take like an inch and a half blade steak off of the pork shoulder and then cut that in half on the saw. So you've got a little bit of bone running through it. And essentially, it's just a, it's a cut in half, really thick pork blade steak. And they sell them as country ribs. I had never seen that before, but... um my plan was to pre-season those and freeze them pre-seasoned so that all the customers would have to do would, would be thawed and throw it on the grill. That's something I'm going to try. Um, cottage bacon. Cottage bacon is a really, really good one. And pe- we're just now being able to turn people on to it. One, um, so cottage bacon, you know, you're brining your whole bone and shoulder just as you would a ham, whether you're pumping it or or dry or wet brining it, um, tumbling it in your tumbler if you have one, and then hanging it and smoking it. And basically, uh, right before you smoke it, you take the pork shoulder out, uh, you put it through a roast netting, and then through a ham sock, hang it and smoke it. Uh, whether it's fully cooked or not, it makes a really, really nice alternative to ba- bacon. It's It's got really good fat. It's a little meatier than bacon. People can really get into it. Uh, I found that a way that was easier for me to sell it is if I cut that that whole uh, pork shoulder in half so it laid flat. Um, and then when I – that was after uh, – I smoked it whole. You know, I netted it and then socked it, smoked it whole. And then when it came out, cut it lengthwise in half. And then when I cut it like bacon, it looked – more like rashers or like shorter stout bacon slices and people really, really were into that. Uh, it was a lot easier to sell when it looked like that more than like a full slice of a shoulder. It looks more like lunch meat, you know, people are really into it. Some other oven ready things uh, are roulades. You know, if you were to say butterfly, your boneless shoulder way, way open. So it's super thin, like you were going to do a, um, an al pastor spit or something and then roll it up with onions and garlic and um, pineapple and maybe some citrus oregano roll that up do a face cut on either end so it looks really nice Um, backpack that tie it like a roast backpack it and then freeze it that way that'd be a really nice ready to eat uh, alternative for a pork shoulder pork stew I know it's not super popular, but if anybody's ever been to New Mexico or Colorado, they have, uh, you know, the Colorado green chili that they make with hatch green chilies. And that's one of the best things 
in life. It's so, so good. You can have a bowl of it. You can put it over anything. You could have a breakfast burrito and just like drown it in this green chili sauce. And it's so, so good. And uh, it's just chunks of pork shoulder, you know, and I never thought that I would buy pork stew, t- pork stew meat until I actually made that dish. Um, and I guess the last one that I'm going to try, this is a, a recipe that I made for a wedding last summer and um, had some good responses from it and then did some pre-packaging of um, some raw meat that was pre-seasoned and needed to be cooked. And it was basically al pastor style fajita pork. And the recipe was super strong. Now, obviously, this isn't something that you're going to be able to incorporate into your, you know, high volume production facility for all of your customers in the cut and wrap. But if you do have a small retail exempt uh, showroom or case or what have you, you know, this might be something, depending on where you're from, that could really move a lot of less desirable pork cuts, whether it be shoulder or uh, some leg muscles or something like that. So I just want to share this recipe. Um, it's very, very tasty and it's kind of derived from, uh, when I used to work in this kitchen, we did a lot of Mexican food and I was lucky enough to, well, I was a dishwasher, but I also got to build the pork spits, which was actually the very first meat cutting I ever did, which was butterflying pork shoulders and building these spits. And so, uh, this recipe is kind of loosely based on that. And I've, I've made it a few more times and, um, so this is this is this is it. It's really good. So Puerco al Pastor. Here's a recipe. Get yourself some Guajillo or New Mexico chilies. Um, you get eight of them. You know you're going to be dealing with five pounds of pork for this recipe. So you'll need eight of those chilies. And then you're going to take those whole chilies and put them in a saucepan with some hot water and bring it up to a boil. Put a lid on it and let them just rehydrate. Basically, once they're rehydrated and they're kind of soft, just take them off the heat and just leave them in the water. You're going to need 10 garlic cloves, one cup of apple cider vinegar, a half a cup of brown sugar, four tablespoons of sea salt, one medium onion, one zested orange, one peeled orange. So reserve the peel and, and the zest from each of those oranges. Um, a half of a whole pineapple, and then your five pounds of boneless pork shoulder. So you can put the chilies um, with the hydrating liquid from the pan and all the other ingredients in that list into a blender and process until smooth. Um, The next thing you need to do is get three tablespoons of achiote paste. So you can buy achiote paste at your local Hispanic grocery store, or you can make it. Um, if you're going to make it, I've got a recipe for it here. It's really stupid good. It's really easy. Um, there's a couple things that you might have to get off of Amazon or from your local co-op or something, but, but it's, it's this stuff. You could just keep it in the freezer and use it for whatever. It's so good. And so what you need for that are three whole cloves, two whole bay leaves, a quarter cup of an auto seed, which you can find at any Hispanic grocery store. Uh, two teaspoons of coriander seed, two teaspoons of cumin seed, toasted, two teaspoons of oregano, one teaspoon of black peppercorn, a teaspoon of salt, five garlic cloves, a quarter cup of apple cider vinegar, one zested lime, and one uh, zested orange. So you're going to put all those spices into a grinder, process them until fine, throw them in a food processor with the, the fruit, the zest from the fruit, the garlic, and the vinegar, and zip it up into a paste. Now you're going to add that to everything from the the ingredients uh, from the first part of the recipe into your food processor. Process it until smooth. Now, you've got your boneless pork shoulder. You're going to cut this into fajita meat. All right. From there, you're going to uh, put the pork into a bowl, and you're going to cover it with the liquid that you've blended up, the marinade. You're going to let that marinade for at least eight hours, but probably overnight. Now from here, what you'll do is you'll, you'll take it and you'll portion it into one pound packages and vac pack it. And if you have any cooking instructions, basically all you need to do is just dump the packet into a pan and cook it until it's cooked all the way through. And it's perfect for tacos or fajitas or any sort of, you know, 
pork and rice and vegetable dish. It's, it's a super, super good one. So, um, it doesn't hurt to package it with some chunked up pineapple, you know, in addition to the pineapple that's in the actual paste, it looks really nice. Um, it sounds like a huge project, but if you make a huge batch of it, like for instance, if I took 200 pounds of this stuff, made a huge batch, it'd last me for probably the entire year. Um, anyways, those are just some different things you could do with pork shoulder aside from selling it to people just for smoking or uh, throwing it in sausage. If you have any capabilities for retail stuff, obviously if you work at a grocery store or any sort of uh, small butcher shop or a large butcher shop, what have you, you've already got an oven ready program and maybe these could just be some things you tried or you have some way more interesting things that you want to share with the meat block and we'd love to hear. Um, and if you work at a processing facility, these ideas might just be for you to take home and share with your family. Um, but yeah, if you have any other value added or ready to eat or oven ready ideas for pork shoulder, send them our way at, uh, at the meat block on Instagram. That's the easiest way to get a hold of us or at American butcher at gather and break or at a farm butcher on Instagram. All right, David, that was great. And thanks for that. There's a lot of great information in there and I certainly learned some stuff and uh, hoped you guys did too. Now cottage bacon from the pork shoulder is one of my favorite cuts and it is so good with some, molasses mixed in there and uh it fries up real nice and if you run a cut and wrap facility and you're thinking about you know doing some smoking and things like that just know that when you smoke bacons when you smoke anything that you could you don't have to make it ready to eat you could still use a safe handling label if you only have one packaging room and then it still encourages the consumer to bring it up to lethality before cooking it. Even though you very well may bring it up to an Appendix A during your cooking process. And this also may help prevent the headache uh, that new cut and wrap facilities or people looking to start a RTE program uh, with the headache of, you know, supporting documentation in a whole HACCP plan when you just, you know, put safe handling on it. And there's still you still have to integrate integrate and add it to your flow chart and still submit it and things like that. But it would just make that whole process easier and not easier. Like you're not scared of hard work or anything, but it, it would allow you to not do all the heavy lifting and still try this out to see if it works. In this next segment, Ryan is going to be talking about history and cutting styles. We wanted you to think that this episode was about the pork shoulder. But really, a real motivation is that we're looking for an excuse to talk about butts and say the word butt a million times. We love butts. All shapes and sizes of butts are fine with us. There are a spectrum of things worth mentioning about butts and lots of really interesting, captivating, compelling things that butts are capable of. For example, a butt is a unit of measurement. The butt, B-U-T-T, also referred to as butt load, was a measure of liquid volume equaling two hogsheads. This equated to 108 imperial gallons, which is 490 liters for ale, or 126 imperial gallons, which is 570 liters for wine, also known as a pipe. So what's a hog's head, you ask? Okay, so a hog's head is a large cask of liquid, or less often, of a food commodity. More specifically, it refers to a specified volume measured in either imperial or U.S. customary measures, primarily applied to alcoholic beverages such as wine, ale, or cider. Okay, all right, but then there's a tobacco hog's head, which was used in British and American colonial times to transport and store tobacco. It was a very large wooden barrel. A standardized hogshead measured 
measured 48 inches long and 30 inches in diameter at the head. Fully packed with tobacco, it weighed about 1,000 pounds. Somewhere along the way, some butchers or sausage makers started ordering a buttload, uh, which was a barrel full of pork shoulders when it was sausage making time. And eventually, the top portion of the pork shoulder became, somehow became referred to as the pork butt or the Boston butt or the top butt. The pork shoulder quite often has a nice ratio of fat to lean, and it's a fairly obvious area to choose for grinding into sausage. It makes sense that if sausage makers were going to order barrels of a certain section of pig to grind into their sausage, they would probably choose the pork shoulder section. The complexity of the mammal shoulder is wonderful, no matter which specific animal species you're working with. Pigs have the floating shoulder, which is to say there's no clavicle bone holding the shoulder in place. There's more reliance on muscles to provide stability rather than bone. This results in a greater range of motion in the front shoulder and foreleg and a fascinating web of muscles that work in concert with each other to produce locomotion. Some of these muscles bear a large percentage of the animal's total weight, being positioned near the heavy skull and under the thick digging and rooting mass of the creature's neck. Adjacent to these large, flavorful workhorse muscles, there are many intricate small muscles also. From a butcher's perspective, there are many roadmaps we could choose to follow when navigating a pork shoulder. The breaking points would be the first thing we need to consider. Where to separate the shoulder from the rest of the carcass. This question is answered by chefs and butchers with more variance than any other animal, even more so than lamb, I would wager. Pork is adored, rightly so, by the culinary world, and the opportunities that a pork carcass provides have been explored very thoroughly by many cooking traditions worldwide. So even a simple question such as where to separate the shoulder and why opens a Pandora's box of possible answers. If the Boston butt section will be utilized for its copa, that being an Italian dry cure preparation for the upper shoulder, I know many butchers will then choose to break the shoulder after the sixth rib or even after the seventh rib, if the priority is to produce a longer belly or a longer spare ribs, some butchers decide to saw the carcass in half lengthwise first before breaking the shoulder from the loin section. Lengthwise being a straight cut that begins by separating the butt from the picnic and continues along separating the belly from the loin. In the production cutting facility where I work, we break the shoulders between the third and fourth rib as part of our standard workflow. This would be the most common breaking point I've seen in the regions I've worked. Breaking here maximizes the amount of rib chops and loin chops that a butcher is then able to produce. And this is our stated objective where I work unless a cut sheet asks us to do otherwise, um, which only happens very seldom. Now, if I was a butcher in France, I might have a completely different set of objectives. French butchery is known for taking a deep dive into seam styles of butchery. Many 
anatomical muscles are extracted at the seam and are recognized for the specific tenderness, flavor, and cookability that they offer. Some culinary traditions want their pork shoulders seamed out in a very similar way to beef shoulders. Some chefs may want to use the pork serratus as an, as an individual piece, a big slab of meat, the pork serratus. Some may want a pork brisket or a pork top blade or, or cross rib. In a restaurant or home kitchen setting, there are many more possibilities available to the person holding the knife. I personally find the front half of the pig to be equal parts terrifying and mystical. Pig heads and shoulders are built with incredible power and functionality. It has been pointed out by many before me that pig's heads are literally shaped like shovels. And these shovel heads together with a hog's wide neck and football player shoulders come together to produce a digging and rooting machine like no other in the mammal world. Especially when you see these characteristics exaggerated in giant breeding stock hogs such as mama sows and old boars, it is uncanny how much girth these animals are inclined to take on. Many boars will actually develop bony armor across their shoulders, reminding me that these animals are built for a life of battle and war, as well as a life of shoveling soil and rooting for food. And somewhere at the interplay of these things, a sow that's 700 pounds hanging weight, A boar with the boar taint, plated armor, and tusks, and skin that when scalded and scraped becomes eerily similar to human skin. Somewhere, somehow, resulting from the interplay and overlap of these things, brought to light by the butcher's knife and the chef's intentionality, there is an ecstatic outcome. To look at the pattern of muscle and fat in a copa is like looking into a kaleidoscope pointed at the sun. No matter how many copas move through my hands across the butcher's block, I am frequently caught dumbstruck. Caught somewhere between the grittiness of the pig's life, the harsh weather, the battle, the commercialization in the factory pig production machine, trying not to dull my knife on the pig's teeth. And I'm caught between the small farmer trying to make ends meet who clearly has put way too much fat on this hog and is now suffering a low yield on this carcass, which translates into wasted money. I'm caught between a production factory style workflow that's necessary to keep costs low and a multitude of old world and new American pork cookery trends. The butcher is at the overlap, at the crosshairs, and the weight of it all is on our shoulders. Sometimes it is a heavy feeling, but most often it's a celebration of that awesome moment in which we are not necessarily in our head nor in our bodies, we are in between. We are in the pork shoulder. Thanks, Ryan. That was awesome. I uh, was told that the reason they were called butts is because they butted up against each other because they were the whitest part of the pig. And then I was also told that they were called butts because uh, they used to ship them in containers called butts. And the reason they're called Boston butts is because the reason... They were uh, shipped in those containers is because they cut them to fit the container, and that's how they caught cut them in Boston in that classic square shape. And this is just going off a of hearsay from other butchers, and I'm glad that Ryan uh, did the research and cleared up some. Guys, this is Travis, and I know I sound super weird compared that I just interrupted myself. 
And I'm glad I picked this episode as I'm re-listening to it, putting um, these breaks in and everything. Uh, there's a lot of weird cadence. I think the show has had a lot of ebbs and flows and valleys. And, and uh, I think this was uh, a good stride for us at the time. Um, and yeah, I hope you're enjoying it. I just want to talk to you guys about about bundlepd.com that you know they have everything you need for ppe that's personal protective equipment you know there's i don't know what it is like where you are specifically but ppe is more than just masks and face shields and they have that they have fully stocked of n95 respirators and face shields and i encourage you to still uh, to wear the stuff to protect you and your fellow coworkers, but they also have PPE for splash protection, PPE for you know gloves. That personal protective equipment, as far as like nitrile gloves, and even PPE falls in line with you know cut gloves and uh, cut resistant uh, wear in this industry. You know you do everything you can not to get cut, and Bunzel is doing everything they can to keep you safe. So check them out, bunzopd.com. Thank you. My lad. Earlier in the episode, I was low on the hog, you know, in the nitty gritty talking about the pork picnic. Now I'm going to move a little bit higher and we're going to be high on the hog and live it up a little bit as I talk about what I would do with the perfect pork butt. Now, this is going to be for raw applications, uh, so there won't be any smoking device here or curing. But let's say you have a five bone, five, yeah, five rib butt, and you have your picnic removed. You have that classic square shape or rectangle shape. So I'm going to take that rectangle shape and I'm going to take it over to the bandsaw. I'm going to set my gauge about a inch and a half, inch and a quarter, nice thick. And I'm going to cut two stakes off of the rib end of this with the collarbone still attached. And I'm going to, you know, maybe leave the, a tray of those whole uncut. And I've heard them called Kansas cities this way. I've heard them called shoulder stakes or pork shoulder stakes this way. Uh, and if I were to cut them in half in between the blade bone and the collar, I've heard them called Southern style or country style ribs. Uh, I don't know what the definitive name is. I know it changes from region to region. And I would love to hear what you, the meathead, call them. So I lost about three inches off that back end. What am I going to do with the rest of the pork butt? Well, I'm going to do a heavy sloppy bone, boning job on that pork collar. I'm going to tray that and hopefully sell that to someone who wants to make a stock or a demi. Because there's tons of rich, nourishing, beautiful cartilage hiding within the nooks and crannies of that spinal column. Now, I need you to shut your eyes as the listener and let me guide you through the next step. So you have your semi-boneless pork butt on your block, lean side up, and you're going to first take your knife, find the end of the blade bone, and cut all the way through and that first roast you're going to get is going to be your boneless butt. Now, there's no boning there because your collar is already removed and you're cutting at the tip of that blade bone or the uh, scapula. I would sell this untrust, hoping that it goes to someone who wants to braise it. Now, the next piece is going to look almost like a perfect square. And with the rind still on it, and uh, flip it up, cross hatch it, then truss it. And you can lattice truss it if you want to be fancy. And then take that, cut all the way through the bone, and then cut the rest in half with a handsaw. You're going to end up with three beautiful roasts out of this one piece. One of them, you're boneless. The other two, bone in. And this is a standard cut that I, or cut sheet, I run in my head. When I think about sides of hogs, knowing that one whole hog will give me two boneless shoulder roasts and four bone in in four Kansas City steaks. With the number of hogs you get, you could easily 
multiply, and subtract depending on order in casework. Also, another very easy, beautiful cut you can make out of the shoulder is take it, bone it out completely, remove the rind, and make it into sausage. It is almost a perfect lean-to-fat ratio, naturally, for sausage. And it's pork, so you don't have to do a deep dive on removing tons of silver skin. Just make sure your glands are out of there, unless you're making a traditional chorizo. All right, that's going to do it for this week's episode of the Meat Block Podcast, all about pork shoulder. And I hope you enjoyed it. And if you want to get a hold of us here at the Meat Block, the best way to do that is by emailing us at the Meat Block Podcast, gmail.com. Tweet us at the Meat Block Pod or Instagram at the Meat Block. And if you head over to our Instagram, we're going to have weekly mini bonus Q&As posted on IGTV. And check that out again. That's at the Meat Block. Also, we have a Facebook group, The Meat Block, where those will be posted as well. And if you want to get a hold of us individually, let's say David is at a farm butcher on Instagram and Ryan is at Gather and Break. If you'd like to get a hold of me, Travis, I am at American Butcher on Instagram and Facebook. And if you're thinking to yourself, man, I love this show and I'd love to support them. Well, the best way to do that right now is by opening up your podcast listening device typing in the meat block, leaving the highest rating you can, and please, please leave a comment. And another way to support us is by tagging us on social media. That thing you look at when you're in the restroom, using the hashtag the meat block. And that's why you could be our meathead of the week. Just like Iverstein Farms, head over to their Instagram page and check them out. And if you live locally to where they are, down there in Baton Rouge, say what up and say hi. Adron Dix he is also a big support on social media for this podcast. Please contact us with any questions or any horror stories. We have some great things in WIP. And until next time, keep your knives sharp and live in the margin. I like big butts and I cannot lie. You other brothers can't deny. I, uh, in the original episode, I played that entire thing and then, uh, also played sure mix a lot, but I, uh, fair use is, is different and I don't want to get, that's the main reason why I stopped doing, um, music in the shows. Monetization. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this and thank you. Uh, next week's episode, it may come out later this week. I, I haven't decided yet. Uh, it really depends on time. But thank you guys. It's in the can. And hope you guys enjoyed. You're really going to like it. And uh, it's, yeah, until next time, keep your knives sharp and live in the margin. Thanks for Bunzel, PD.com, for supporting us, the industry. And head over. If, if you cut meat, it's like the Sears catalog for meat cutters and butchers. Just head over there, request a catalog, and just peruse and make a wish list, you know, and leave hints uh, of if you have a birthday coming up. I know where. Uh, so, yeah. Check them out. BunzelPD.com. Thanks. <laughs>